My name is Andy Suzo. I'm the founder and CEO of Y2K Credit Solutions. And Y2K Credit Solutions is a debt settlement and credit restoration company. Um, I want you guys to remind me why I said that. There's a reason why I'm saying that now. And it has to do with credit, but remind me at the end of my speech to tell you why I said it that way. Um, been in business 13 years, nine locations in the US, two in Canada. And um, we're all credit, credit all day, every day, credit. Um, a lot of you guys can hear, you guys are going to hear a lot of information about home buying, first time home buyers, flipping properties, and so forth. But the reason why I asked to be first is because throughout the whole uh, event, credit is the driving vehicle of any financial decisions you're going to make in your life. <clears throat> Purchase home, first time home buyers. It's all credit, credit, credit. Credit drives everything. Credit drives the interest rate, the score, right? So we're going to talk about credit. I'm going as deep as I can with it for you guys and um, ask some questions. So before I start, how many of you guys have seen your credit report or know your credit score or understand credit or how it works? And now it's from Credit Karma. Put <laughs> it back down. No Credit Karma. So Credit Karma is not accurate. It's a soft book. It's free. Right? Nothing is free in this country, right? You can't be that accurate. But Credit, Car credit Karma is a platform to advertise for credit card companies. It's not a full report, it's not real time data, and the score is 40 to 50 points behind. So, to answer your question, to answer my question, when I asked you guys about credit, when you saw your scores at, Credit Karma is not that accurate. It's only good if someone is using fraud or applying for credit cards in your name and it alerts you. To get real time data, it's either through a mortgage company. Or creditcheckTotal.com. If you want to know your real data, creditcheckTotal.com. Oh, we have a slide. Um, it's a dollar to sign up. It's real-time data, all the viewers. So, let's talk about credit. What do you guys know about credit? No, no yeah, you want to, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. What's your name? I'm Pascal. Pascal. What, what do you know about credit? Have you, do you use credit? What is that? Okay, so you're an investor. You're an investor, first time home buyer. Well, I own a home. Perfect, perfect. So you use credit for your mortgages, your hard money, or do you do conventional? Well, the one I have currently is a home on my home. Okay. Because I originally bought it, and then I just took some money off of it. Okay. So you refi property. So just so you guys know, interest rate drives, you sorry, your credit score drives your interest rate. Money is bought at an interest rate. Money is traded on the stock market at a rate. Higher the score, lower the rate. Lower the score, higher the rate. Now, I'm assuming a lot of you guys are going to be first time home buyers. So credit is used heavily, not only to purchase the home, to get your homeowner's insurance. Right? Because they use that to run your credit. They, use your, they run your credit to approve you for the premium. It's also used to turn your utility on. It's used for your cable book. So now you purchase a home, first time home buyers, you need to fix the house. If you're a first time home buyer, it's nine out of 10 times, you probably only have three and a half percent down, which is okay. You're probably gonna have the closing costs or you're gonna roll it in to your, your mortgage. So now you got to you bought a house, you get some renovations, you need to fix it, you don't have liquid. You know, I, a couple days ago I spoke about free money, what free money is. You go to places like Lowe's, Home Depot, they'll give you, with a good credit score, good credit, they'll extend you credit cards with no interest for 36 months. That's free money, because you pay back what you use without no interest. You use that to fix your home. So, and what I'm trying to say is without credit, a lot of things are not going to happen for you. It's not going to work in your favor. You're going to be spending a lot more money though in the long run, right? Um, if you're first time home buyers and let's say your credit score is 620. By the way, there's a difference between traditional banks and mortgage lenders, right? Traditional banks are Chase, CD, TV Capital, and Bank. Their requirement is 720 and up to give you a mortgage, right? Then you go to a, a mortgage lender. Anyone can fund a mortgage, 
with a five million credit score, but what's your rate? And that's what you have to be concerned with. Because if you're a first time home buyer, most of the time, everyone is just putting in all its savings to buy this house, the interest rate is high. Now, let's say six months later, life happens. You lost your job, you can't pay for this house. The interest rate is so high, you end up going foreclosed, right? So, credit is a driver for people of any financial decision you guys can use. You guys can do. When purchasing a home, flipping even hard money. Some lenders with credit for they send the money to you. So it's all credit, 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 credit. Um, what, who else use credit? Well, who else was first per person in your first home? Oh, Tika, what are you doing here? Who was who's first time home buyers here? Okay. Have you started your home? You got the approval? Which area are you looking to purchase? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Rick. Oh, okay, okay, so you're going out of state. So it's gonna be your first home or an investment. All right, so when you're doing conventional loan, I'm assuming that's what you're gonna do, right? 20% down? Oh, this guy has some secrets over here. <laughs> you wanna share with this guy? They wanna know. <laughs> but um, coming back to credit, it's all, everything is credit. The higher the score is, the lower the interest rate is gonna be, less money out of your pocket, right? Um, for example, let's say you had a $100,000 parking in the bank. That money's not making any interest, right? It's about one, one, one percent, whatever the charge in the banks. Let's say you go to a place like Philly. You take that hundred thousand, you buy five properties for hundred thousand each, twenty thousand on each property, right? This number I'm just making it up. It's not factual. Let's say five years later, property goes up. You turned your hundred thousand into five hundred thousand, but you pull hundred thousand equity out of it. But it all depends on the rate, right? So what I'm trying to say is, if you understand how the bank system works, and you have good credit, it's not a nine to five to get rich in this country. It's your first home and credit, that's it. If you understand the system, how it works, right? Um, got a little bit of time for some Q&A. Anybody <coughs> have any questions? If you have any questions, just let me know. I'll come over to you remind you whatever. Anything about credit. Let everybody engage that one. Check, check. If I got a question? Tika has a question. Yes. All right, Tika, there you go. Who are you? Yes, Tika. Who is yourself? You don't feel like you're going to need that. There's no reason. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Tika. I'm also a realtor from Home Smart Cross Island, Queens. So my question to you, right, you just mentioned that you can use your, all you need to get rich is your credit and your first home. You want to elaborate on that? Tell us exactly how we can do that? All right, so basically, I do. I, I, I'm a testimony, testimony, testimonial of what I'm doing. So basically, perfect credit, I, I bought my first home in Miami. I have tenants in there. And if you understand the market and the financial market, the census report showed that 288,000 people left New York in December of 2018. You can't afford to live here. So you're always going to have renters in another state. However, the 288,000 people that left here, you can't tell me 50% of those people left with no baggage. They baggage with debts. So you move to a state where it's cheaper, income is cheaper, and you still have debts. So I'm always going to have renters in these states. Always. So basically, 20% down, purchase my first home have a tenant in there, long-term tenant, building equity on the property. Five years later, the property went up in Miami. I pulled the equity out, purchased another home, put another tenant in there. Three years later, the property went up again, purchased another home. So basically, tenants are paying my mortgages. All I'm putting out is 20% down payment. That's all I'm putting. They pay the mortgage, the maintenance fee, the HOA fee, all that's included in the rent. The thing is, it's kind of hard to rent in New York because of the laws. The laws are for the tenants. You go out of state, you don't have to, and everyone is scared to rent and invest and rent out to people because of the, the laws, right? You go to a state like Georgia, North Carolina, 30 days, the market is there to kick you out. So you don't have to worry about someone just living in your property for a year and not paying your mortgage, right? 
So all I'm doing is pulling money out of my property all day. Buying another property, putting a tenant in there. But I'm purchasing these states where I know people are moving and they can't afford to buy it. At the end of my whole plan is to pull all the money out of all my properties, buy myself a mansion, and then liquidate all my properties. That's the whole point behind it. And I'm collecting rents and building equity. And it's paying off my mortgages. Right? That's what I meant by that. Karan is my realtor, actually. Um, Karan is that. He serviced a lot of white gate I know that signs. He's actually showed me an eight million dollar property. Where the money came from? All the real estate that I had. I pulled it out. Parked in a bank with my property. So that's what I'm doing with the money. And so again, credit is everything. And my interest rates are very low. Right? Um, the only thing you want to be careful is that make sure before you go into any kind of big transactions in real estate, the credit is up to par because it is going to hurt you long term if it's not financial. Right? Um, so I asked you guys to remind me why I said, well, who here had, has maybe credit issues or some issues you try to use another company to fix your credit? To be honest, that's why we're here. It's the reason why I said I'm a debt settlement and credit restoration company. And I'm just going to take the last few minutes to speak about what my company does. But um, who here has used a credit company to fix their credit? OK. Credit qualified? Uh, well, what was the results? To be honest. Sure. All right. So there's two, two, three things I'm going to tell you guys. My company's not a letter system. It's group, right? It's group letters. We're a coding company. By trade, I'm a software developer for transunion credit leaders. That's why I started the company in 2006. You guys ever heard of Portfolio Recovery Associates? So on your credit report, they freeze your bank account and all that? You guys heard? No, did you have yes? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I wrote that software in 2006, right? When I wrote the SOAR and we tested it in beta, I took the SOAR and I left TransUnion. We coded it to what we are right now. The reason why I said I'm a debt settlement credit restoration company is because credit restoration doesn't exist. That's why these companies write letters with no letter that is sent on your behalf. Right? Every client has a responsibility of debt. The debt has to be resolved first before it comes over the credit. So basically, you come to my company, you pull your whole rack. That my time to go. <laughs> that was so basically, when you come to my company, you put your whole rap sheet. I see everything you have when you were 17 to current. Right? Um, let's say you have a debt on your credit. Your total debt is $10,000. And again, every consumer has a responsibility of debt. Your debt's not leaving you. It just cycles around, cycles around until it turns into a judgment before the statute of limitation expires. So the difference between my company and these uh, other companies like Lexington Law, in the industry, there's something called servicing your debt and owning your debt, right? The servicing a debt where a third party collection agency is just servicing the debt for you, for the original creditor. They call you all, they're harassing you. Hey, you gotta pay this, pay this, pay that, whatever, whatever, whatever. These companies send a letter, the collection agency is gonna come off your credit. And then it goes back to the original creditor. Now in 1690 days, the debt comes back to another collection agency in your credit report. That's going to be suck if you're in the middle of a mortgage deal, you're about to close, and they pull your credit right before closing. There's a special agency that can rent. That's not believing it has to be resolved. So when you come to my company, we take your $10,000 worth of debt, bring it down to $2,500. That's your responsibility. Once that resolved, we clean the credit up. We own the rights to that debt now. Our process is completely totally different. Our work is guaranteed. Um, and anything credit related we can fix. You just tell me where you want to go and we'll put you there. So with that, with that being said, let's open it up to Q. So I am Sabine Franco. I am the owner of Franco Law Firm PC. We are a real estate transactions law firm. So we practice primarily, I'm gonna get down here because I feel more comfortable, is that okay? Can everybody see me? Uh, so like we that. practice primarily in the area of real estate law. Uh, we've been in business since 2012 which is seven years, seven years go by real fast. Thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, we're licensed in New York and New Jersey. So who am I? So I've uh, been practicing law for seven years. I graduated from Hofstra Law School in 2011 and then started my firm shortly after that in 2012. 
Thank you, thank you. So um, in, uh, before I went to law school, I worked in the mortgage lending industry. So I worked, I supported loan officers, I worked for banks, and that kind of opened up my eyes to the, the real estate, uh, whole real estate uh, industry. And um, I went, I worked in finance and then didn't really love that and decided to go to law school. And then seven years later, here we are, here I am. <laughs> so um, I talk a lot about first time home buying and um, the home buying process and the role of the real estate attorney. But what Matt really wanted you guys to know about is estate planning so that when you accumulate all of this wealth when you go out there and you buy and you invest and you you grow and you build you now have all of this all of these assets to deal with so what do you do with that so I just wanted to shed some light with for, for you on the trust and estates process not really the process but what tools are out there to basically hey, how you doing? <laughs> what tools are out there to basically help you um, manage all of this wealth and make sure that you leave that for the people who you who you're doing it for, your children, your loved ones, your family. You want this to be able to pass it on and you don't want the state to take it or whatever the case is or to go to taxes. So what is estate planning? So estate planning is the process where you create a plan for the end of your life. You basically create a plan for all of your entire estate. What is your estate? Your estate is all of the things that you have. Everything that you have that's of value, your property, your bank accounts, your, um, your retirement, everything that you own is part of your estate. And so that is something that you want to plan for so that you'll be able to transfer that, pass that on, and um, make all your hard earn, your hard work uh, pay off, right? Um, it assures you that the properties that you have in your fin financial affairs could be transferred easily and it could go to who exactly you want it to go to. All right? Next, next slide. Now, why do you want, and why do you want to plan for real estate? Why do you want to plan for um, tomorrow? Not going up? Okay, so I had a picture up that showed you Prince, right? So Prince died in 2016. Next slide. Prince died in 2016 with over $200 million worth of assets and no plan. Absolutely no plan. Could you imagine? He was only 57 years old. So I'm sure he didn't think that he was going to, you know, just pass away like that. And so two years later, or almost three years later now, his family hasn't seen a dime of that. But $5.96 million had been spent in legal fees just to figure out how much his assets are worth and who it should go to, what, what it should do. And especially when you're someone like that, you know, his assets are, um, include intellectual property, which is like the rights to his music, his creativity, and those things need to be valued. So imagine if it's only three years later, they've already spent $6 million. What happens by the time they finish figuring all of this stuff out, you know? So some of the tools that I wanted to show you about, um, the tools that you could use to plan for uh, real estate. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, <laughs> trust in estates. So why do you need it? It helps you to determine which of your loved ones could acquire your assets, right? Who are you gonna leave it to? You may not necessarily wanna leave it to your natural heirs, which would be um, your children or your siblings or something like that. You may want to leave it to somebody else. You may have a charity that you loved or you may um, have something that you're passionate about like you know, art where you wanna create a foundation or something like that. So you can decide exactly what it is that you do with your wealth, and, but you have to plan for it or else somebody else is gonna decide for you. You can control um, your legal fees. If Prince had planned for his estate to be transferred, he could have sat down with his legal team and planned out every single aspect of his estate and not have the money just being burned through figuring things out, right? You can minimize the amount of taxes that your, that your um, estate kind of incurs because if you plan in certain ways, there are ways that you could protect so that when your wealth transfers, the taxes are not as, you don't get hit as hard with taxes, all right? I'm not a CPA, but I do know that uh, that is a fact. So um, you could plan for a funeral arrangement. You could provide for minors if you have children. Um, and when you pass away, if they're not old enough, to kind of take your wealth, 
you can plan for what's going to happen to to them and how they're going to be taken care of with your with your um, with your finances that you left them or the inheritance that you left them. If you don't, it could be uh, it could be very bad for them. Okay. And it also gives you a peace of mind. It gives you a peace of mind to know that when you move on, everything that you work hard for, that your family, your loved ones, whoever that you want is going to get it, and you don't have to worry about it just you know, being lost. Okay. So these are some of the tools that are used for estate planning. This, this is just a, a brief overview. There's many things that can be done um, depending on what type of asset you have. You can have um, real estate, you can have uh, stocks, you could have you know, bonds, you could have um, retirement accounts. All these things have s separate ways that they could be planned for to help protect your assets. So these are just some of the things. A revocable trust that I'm going to go over, a will, a power of attorney, a healthcare proxy, and then of course education because education is key to anything that we do. So what is um, a trust? A trust is a legal way to hold property for the benefit of another. So a trust is sort of like a separate entity. If you guys think of it like a, like a business entity, you know how a business is separate from you? It has like its own identity. So the same with a trust. A trust can transact business, you know, a trust can buy, a trust can sell, a trust can invent, invest, and a trust can also hold your assets. So if you transfer your assets to a trust, it could be protected and there are creative things that can be done with all of your assets inside of a trust. There are different types of trust. The one I'm going to talk about, focus on, is a revocable trust. And a revocable trust can be changed during your lifetime. So you can make a decision about what you want to do with an asset. You can then decide you want to either change your mind or you want to sell it or you want to do something different. You want to give it to somebody else you want to change the person who's going to be in charge of taking care of those assets, all those things you could do during your lifetime with a revocable trust. So it's not an end-all, be-all you know, decision that you make. You do have flexibility. Another type of trust is a irrevocable trust. And there are reasons why you would do that, where you make a decision about your estate, and then you leave it like that, and you don't change it, right? So there are reasons to do that. So a revocable trust is like a contract. So it's a contract between the creator, the person who makes the trust, who's giving uh, or transferring their assets. It's, um, there's also a trustee who's going to be the person who controls and manages the trust. And then there's going to be beneficiaries, the people who are going to reap the benefit of either the income or owning the actual properties in the trust eventually. And the good thing about a trust is that you, know, you can manage all of your assets right from the trust. You can keep your, your, um, your estate and your, your properties and your affairs, you can keep it private. Because when you go through the court system, you know, if, if, you, if there is a will, which I'll talk about, and you, or there isn't a will, and you have to go through the court system, it's really a public, it's really in the public. It can be discovered by other people because it's public record. So when you, a lot of people, a lot of especially large estates, they will do trust because they don't really want everyone to know what exactly they have and what's being you know, passed or managed. So it's a way to keep your estate uh, private. And then again, you can protect, your, you can protect um, minors and irresponsible heirs. So a lot of times, I know it, like in our communities, our parents have worked hard for certain things, they have built some wealth sometimes, um, they have invested, but because of the culture, they may not have educated their children about what it is that they have. And then if their children, you know, don't know what they have or are not, um, not, they don't understand how to take care of it, then they necessarily can't be expected to be responsible when they inherit all of this. So if you plan for them, you know, you could put someone in charge of the funds and whatever income, or whatever benefits are coming from what you have built, you can put someone in charge of that so that they can be taken care of, so that your children could be taken care of. And that's why I also wanted to, you know, later on talk about how important it is to educate. Next one. So another, another good thing about a trust is that you could avoid probate. So probate is the process where you basically, um, your, your, your affairs are, are um, 
kind of like looked over or, or decided by a court how it's going to be distributed, right? So the court is basically governing and in charge of how your estate is going to be uh, distributed and it can be kind of expensive. It could be a long process, um, it could be confusing, it could cause a delay if, you know, someone dies or if, you know, someone dies and, someone, and their family or the people who are taking the interest in their estate, if they say they want to move on, they want to just, you know, sell a property and move on or they, they don't want to really have to deal with um, all of the ins and outs of the court system, it could be a, you know, a real big problem for them. So if you plan to have a trust, you can kind of help them avoid that. Another good thing about a trust is that if you have property in all different types of states, right? Not different types of states, but in different states. So if you have property in Philly, you have property in Jersey, you have property in Florida, if you have all of your properties owned by the one trust, then if something happens to you, 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 you pass away, your family does not have to go to each state and deal with transferring that property. They don't have to go to each state and go to court and have the court, you know, go through the whole court system process to transfer that property or change the, the ownership of that property. If all of that property is owned by the trust, it'll be much easier for them to do whatever it is that they need to do with your estate. No, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so um, the next thing that I want to talk about is a will. So what is a will? A will is a legal document basically where you're going to write down or someone's going to put into, into, into words for you what it is that you want to do with your estate. So a will allows you to decide exactly how you want every single thing that you own to be transferred. It's within your power to make that decision so that the court system doesn't do it for you. The, the court system will give, the, w give your assets to whoever it is that's in your, um, in your lineage according to just how the law says, but that might not be what you want. So if you have a will, you'll be able to, di to dictate that for yourself. It's necessary, especially if you have young children. Um, it, young, if you have young children and you pass away, who's going to take care of your children? Who's going to be that person? I know we all have like godmothers and godfathers, but legally, that, that I'm sorry? <laughs> it, that can happen. So you can plan... You know, if you even want your friend to raise your child and be the guardian of your child, you can plan for that if you have a will in place. And then you can appoint an executor, a person who you trust, um, a person who you find that's responsible to deal with transferring or distributing all of your assets. And usually a will is also used with a trust because when you have, say you set up a trust and you put all of your assets, your, your houses, your your, um, your stocks or whatever it is, you put it inside of the trust, your personal belongings, you put them inside of a trust. Um, so say you create that and you built more, more wealth and you didn't get a chance to go back and uh, edit your trust or amend your trust or anything like that. Now, the will will say, if there's anything that falls out of my trust, then I want that to be poured into my trust, right? Or, if there's something wrong with your trust and your trust is considered invalid, like there was a mistake that was made and your trust is not valid, then the will could say that if my trust is invalid, then everything that I said that I wanted to happen in my trust, I want the will to make sure that happens, right? So you, these things you could do to protect yourself, but there has to be a plan for it. You don't want to, to have things just out there and not have a plan for how that's going to be transferred and how it's going to be protected. And so another thing that's, that's useful for people who are, say you, you're, you're thinking that, you know, I don't want to do an estate plan. I think it's too expensive. That may be the case. There may be a cost involved, but it's much more expensive. Like we could see in the case with Prince, it's much more expensive to have it just fall into the hands of the public and be decided for you, right? So one thing that you could do uh, while you are just, um, while you're healthy and, and well, 
you can have a power of attorney. Especially if you're someone who's investing in real estate, you're buying a bunch of assets, you may not always be there to be able to handle your affairs. So you should always have a backup because you don't know what could ever happen to you, right? So a power of attorney is a document that where you can give permission to somebody else, right, an agent, you can give permission to somebody else to help make these decisions for you. You can still make your decisions, they can act while you're acting, but you can give someone the, the, the ability to help you manage and sell real estate, help you with um, bank accounts, help you with insurance, anything financial they can help you with. And you can make it as specific as you want, you can make it as broad as, as you want, you can, um, you can limit it, you can have it for a short period of, a time, a short period of time, but you can plan for these things to help you. I had a situation where um, a client's family, a client's father had, had a stroke and was in the hospital and couldn't make the decisions for himself. And so at the last minute, they're like scrambling, like, oh, we want to get a power of attorney. We want, you know, we want um, to be able to you know, help with his finances or whatever it is. And he had a wife who, who was also elderly, so they wanted to be able to provide. And they couldn't because once you, are, once you don't have like your right state of mind, then you can no longer sign a power of attorney. You have to have what's called capacity. You have to be able to understand what you're signing and you have to be able to understand what the effect of that document is and what kind of rights you're giving. So it's very scary when somebody's in that situation and you're like, wow, I really wanna help you, but it's like, what can we do? This person can't legally give this, this right. So that's why it's, it's really important to be able to, to, to plan these things. And I know it's like, we we'll always get to the point where we're like, oh, I'm gonna get to it, I'm gonna get to it, I know I need to do this, but you really do need to do it, you know, even if you're fine. Because you wanna, one, you wanna be taken care of, two, you want your family to be able to make the right decisions for you. And so the next, um, so how can you use a, a, a power of attorney? So I said that you could use it uh, for financial reasons, you could use it for the life of the person, and you could even use a power of attorney if somebody's what we call incapacitated, if they can't make decisions for themselves. You can still use the power of attorney as long as it's a durable power of attorney, right? Which means that once something, once they, they lose their sort of like right state of mind, you could still make those decisions for them with that power of attorney. And it can be changed. It could be, you know, what we call revoked, which means you could terminate it at any time that you want. But at least if you have that, or at least if you have one prepared and you leave it with someone who you trust, then if they need it, then whoever you have appointed, at, you have, who, whoever you have appointed as your agent, the person who's gonna make those decisions for you, that person could then have access to that. You know, even if you're, even if you're you know, you've lost your right state of mind. So it's, it's, it's really important to plan. And then another thing that's a good document to have is a healthcare proxy. A healthcare proxy allows someone to make a decision for you if you're like in the hospital, if, if, you, if you need um, life-saving treatment or if you don't want life-saving treatment. You could basically put all that information together and say, listen, if this happens to me, I want this person to make these decisions. I want them to be able to say yes to this or no to that so that your actual wishes can be had. Another thing is sometimes when um, there, there's, there's um, situations where you might, someone ends up in a hospital, right, and they can't, they, they can make decisions, but they're not really all there, right? So if the, the, the law will allow for a doctor to determine whether or not you are, you are able to make decisions for yourself, but if your loved one knows that, mm, Auntie may be there, but she don't seem like herself, you know? If she had a healthcare proxy or something of that nature, that would be able to help them help you with those decisions. They could say, listen, this is really her, his or her true wishes, okay? I know it's not, it's not sexy and exciting information, <laughs> but it's something that we need to have, and it's very important that you take care of yourselves and you plan for your future. Um, and then so there's also something that's called a living will with with a healthcare proxy will help give details about exactly what type of treatments if you, that you want. So God forbid we're talking about cancer or something like that, you can say, I, I want um, chemo, or I don't want chemo, I, I do, you know, it depends on, there's a lot of things that can be said, but it gives details to the person who has your healthcare proxy on what exactly to do for you. 
And then lastly, I wanted to talk about education, how important it is to um, educate your children and your heirs on what it is that, what assets that you have. If you, if you are an investor, teach them how to invest. If you own property, teach them how to manage and own the properties. Teach them how to get financing. Teach them how to, to be a landlord. Teach them how to, if they can't be a landlord, to get someone to help them manage the properties. You know, give them the tools. Because a lot of times we just walk around and we just, you know, we go about our lives and we don't really take the time to, to explain to our children what we're doing. Take them with you. You know, there's realtors in the room, there's bankers in the room. Take them with you so that they can learn what you're doing and what exactly it is that, you know, they're looking to inherit. And if they decide that they don't want to, also teach them what they should do to transfer it or get rid of it so that they don't lose it. Okay? So I hope that was helpful to you. I know. <laughs> you know, I, I, I love, you know, helping people and making sure that, you know, um, everyone has the knowledge that they need. So I, I'm, I'm so happy to come here to be able to share what I can on this subject. Hi, guys. I'm Ms. Business. Um, I am a certified public accountant. I, outside of taxes, I help individuals with business formation, tax preparation. Um, I do have a large clientele of real estate investors. I do work with a lot of brokers. Um, just because once you guys get assets, it is time for you to start getting a team in place that consists of your CPAs, of your lawyers, because tax laws are now in effect for the benefit of the tax of the um, real estate investor and as well as the um, of the business owner right so it's important that you guys have these people on your team so that's me and who I am those are all of my services I do have a great relationship with ADP and Bank of America so once you guys you know your real estate investors once you start having contractors on your team and you know you guys have payroll and all of those things I can help you with that so before I start, I want to talk to you guys about mindset, right? You guys are shifting from a mindset of, well, I guess before I get into that, who in the room is here because they are purchasing their first property for like their own personal property? Raise your hand, like their first personal property that you're gonna live in as your primary residence. So we have about two or three people. And who are the people here that are looking to start investing in real estate? Okay, so we have a lot of real estate investors. Good for you guys. I mean, not saying that it's not good for you homeowners, but I'm going to talk to you guys about <laughs> why you should, why you should um, you know, consider conducting that as a business, as, as a landlord, right? It's a ton of deductions that you just kind of don't get as a homeowner. So I want to talk to you guys about mindset, right? So who is the tax code written for? I was gonna ask that question, but I kind of told you guys already. <laughs> but the tax code, especially with Trump now in office, is written in favor of the business owner as well as the real estate investor, right? There has been a ton of new tax codes and laws that has been pretty much stripped away from the homeowner and then given to the real estate investor, right? Hence Trump, he's in real estate, right? So um, that, that's what you guys have to keep in mind. Now, now that you're acquiring assets, you need a professional team, right? I have clients, and of course, I'm sure, I don't know if, you know, you guys do this, but I'm a CPA. I charge, I'm a CPA, right? People will call me and say, so why should I use you over using TurboTax? And I'm like, well, I'm not going to sit here and try to justify why you should use TurboTax, but I have clients that have homes and have assets. And they're like, yeah, I wasn't, I heard that I should be able to write some stuff off for my home, but I wasn't able to. I'm like, yeah, that's because you now have assets and you need someone who is knowledgeable. These uh, data collecting softwares, as I call them, they are for the benefit of to collect your data, give you high level information, um, right? They pay into campaigns. The idea is to have you guys leave money on the table, which as business owners alone, leave $2 billion on the table every year when dealing with taxes. Car chase. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you guys just have to be mindful. It's okay. And I tell my clients, if you just have a W-2, go do your own taxes, right? But the moment you start getting assets and start investing, you guys need a CPA on your team. Now, you can't ignore taxes. I have a lot of clients, 
like to ignore it, right? Act like it doesn't exist. I'm not especially real estate. I don't know how many real estate agents I have in here, but the 1099 people, <laughs> they love to ignore taxes because they don't want to deal with, you know, they don't want to deal with it. But what you guys have to realize is that the IRS interest compounds every day. It, it, it compounds daily. And so you don't want to ignore it. And on top of income tax, right, we're paying sales tax, property tax, exercise tax. Um, so many taxes that you don't even realize it, right? But there's 12 of them, and so we don't want to ignore taxes. And so that's why wealthy people, their main objective is to minimize their tax. That's what they do. They hire professionals to make sure that they are minimizing their taxes, and that's because we don't realize it, but everywhere we go, we are being taxed, right? And so just put here, like, you are now a business. You have real estate you're now a business. I don't care if it's for your personal residence or if it's for investment properties, you are now considered a business. You need to be thinking about these things. And then the last, have the conversation with your team um, before making these investments. I have like with Matt, I work with Matt with a ton of people and he gives me clients, I give him clients. And the idea and what our communication is that you need to be having these conversations with your mortgage lender, your real estate, I mean, your mortgage broker, your CPA, your lawyer. You need to have these conversations beforehand, right? Because if you have a property and let's say you are a real estate broker and you're like, okay, I want to buy my property. But let's say, hypothetically, you've generated $100,000, but then you're saying, okay, well, I want to write, I don't want to pay taxes, so I'm going to write off 75000 of this. But then you go to Matt with $25,000, right, showing income, you can't, you're not going to get approved. Right? So you got to make sure that everyone is speaking to each other. And I know that everyone doesn't want to pay taxes, but when it comes to getting these loans, your tax returns are going to speak volumes. Right? They're going to ask, you know, what should, I need your past two years of taxes. So you need to make sure that your taxes is um, on point. So now you're going from how can I get a refund to how can I protect my assets and pay less in taxes. So that is always a mind shift that I have to deal with when I'm, like first time homeowner, I mean home buyers or um, not home buyers, first time investors or business owners. For me, I always tell them, they're like, so if I write this off, how much, how much of a refund can I get? I'm like, you need to be more concerned with how much taxes you're not gonna have to pay versus you know, how much of a refund you're gonna get. The days, you get refunds when you pay into refund. I mean, when you pay into taxes all year. If you weren't getting taxes taken out all year, you can't come at the end of the year and say, hey, like, I want a refund, right? So you have to shift your mind from being the employee to being the employer. And as being the employer, you now have to pay taxes. So the idea is that you guys are maximizing your deductions, that you are writing off what you're supposed to write off and taking advantage of tax codes that's applicable to you. Right. You can go to the next. You can go to the next slide. Okay, I had to touch on this. Matt made sure that I touched on this. To LLC or not to LLC? I think that I'm asked that question all the time. Should I put my property in an LLC? Should I put my property in LLC? Right. So, what I'm going to say to you from a tax perspective is it depends right? And it depends on what your investment strategy is. And that's what's important. If you are going to go into real estate and you plan to hold on to your, um, to your real estate, you plan on doing long-term investing, you should have an LLC. However, if it's a situation where you are going to uh, do flips, now you should consider possibly being an S-Corp if you don't have any partners. So if it's just you, and you're saying, okay, well, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to do some flips, and that's all I want to do, you need to be an S-Corp. Reason being is because once you flip that property, most of the time it is under a year, right? Um, nine times out of ten, you are not, you're not going to go past a year. And even if you do, once you sell that property, property for a profit, you are going to have to pay self-employment tax on that money, and you're going to have to pay income tax on that money. Right? And so a way to kind of get around that is by creating an S-corporation 
and having your property sit under that S corporation versus it being under LLC, because if you're an LLC and you're a single member, nine times out of 10, you're gonna have, and if you are operating at a profit, you are going to have to pay that self-employment tax, right? Self-employment tax is about 15.3%. So if you are two plus member, because I know I'm gonna get this question, if, you have, if it's two plus members, you can do an LLC, it's fine. The, the, um, the flow of your income is going to be the same. Right, so two plus members, you can do LLC. One plus member and you're flipping, you should be S Corp. Long term, you should be LLC, right? So, uh, okay, sorry. So what I did want to talk to you guys a little bit more um, in detail about is I get a lot of questions. Everyone gets structure happy. Right? They're like, oh, I want to create a holding company, and I want the holding company to hold this company, and then I'm going to create this company. Stop creating all these entities that's causing you guys to spend extra money in forming companies. It's not benefiting you. If you are the 100% owner of property A, then you're 100% owner of the holding company. Your money is just flowing up. Right, so it doesn't matter how many structures you create, if you're making yourself 100% owner of every single company, it's no tax benefit for you, right? And so maybe you guys should sit down with the CPA to say, hey, what are strategies? Like there are strategies where you can put it inside of certain entities and it will help you, but just creating and making it one streamline of a funnel of, okay, I'm gonna create an LLC here, then I'm gonna create another LLC, then I'm gonna have a parent company that's an LLC, that don't work, right? They, they, that doesn't work. That just kind of leaves your money that you create at the bottom and it flows up. So I wanted to talk to you guys um, about some tax strategies before. I only had 15 minutes, so I'm trying to get you know, enough information out to you guys um, as possible. So there are some tax strategies that you guys should be aware of, right? Because taxes could hit you guys really hard, right? You don't want to go through getting all this lending and, and you know, going to all these seminars to invest in real estate to only get to that point at the end of the year and now you owe half of your earnings to the IRS because you haven't structured your company correctly or you haven't like written off the right things or taken advantage of tax codes. So wanted to just talk to you about 1031 exchange. So 1031 exchange really for my real estate investors is when you have a property and let's say you sell this property Instead of paying taxes on that capital gain, what you'll do is you'll find, if you find a property within 180 days of selling your property, you can put that money inside of escrow. You can't touch it. So you can't be like, all right, I'm going to take this money. I'm going to bowl out. I'm going to like, you know, put it back later. No. You have to sell the property, put it inside of escrow, and then purchase a property of like kind, right, within 180 days, and you're able to get away from paying capital gain taxes, right? So that's very important, especially for my real estate investors, right? So then we have depreciation. I have so many clients that are not taking appreciation. I mean, depreciation, right? So with depreciation, what that is, it's when you, let's say you purchase a home for, I don't know, let's say $100,000, right? Over a period of 27 and a half years, you can write the value of that house off, right? So right there, if you're not depreciating your home over time, you're leaving money on the table, right? And so that's why that is important. And that, again, is something for my real estate investors. It is not something for my real estate homeowners, right? So that is a write-off that real estate investors get that real estate um, just homeowners do not get. So now you have your tax-free capital gains, right? So this one is for my homeowners. If you live in your property for two out of the five years, um, once you sell it, you do not have to pay taxes on that capital gain. Right, and so that is, that's one perk, and it's up to $250,000 if you're married, it's up to $500,000. So hypothetically, if your profit exceeds that, then you would just have to pay um, taxes on the, um, whatever exceeds that $250,000 if you're single, and whatever exceeds the $500,000 if you're married. Um, and then tax reform. So a good thing with tax reform for real estate investors, um, and I don't know if anyone already has real estate um, 
for 2018 if you guys already are investors. But a really good um, change to the tax code was that you can depreciate. So let's say capital improvements, right? So those are like your HVACs, things that you need to do to your home to make sure that you know it's in livable condition. Before that, you were you were able to you could depreciate that over five years. Now, in 2018, you were able to depreciate it in the in 2018, 100% of it, right? However, that depreciation is going to now start to um, decrease over time. So now, in 2000, meaning 2019, you'll be able to write off 80% of it, and then the 20% will have to be depreciated over five years, right? And so that's major because years ago where you know you had to kind of spread out this cost now you're able to take it in the year of it's, the year it's incurred which is doing what it's reducing your tax liability right so that means it's ta less taxes that you have to pay on that rental income that you are receiving and so that's pretty much it Matt, did i do good did you get my 15 minutes yeah, yeah you're good you're good <laughs> so we're going how's everybody doing today Great. wonderful wonderful uh just because of our time restraints uh a little bit about me uh, is in your manual. So I want to jump right into a story that I was actually watching the other day. And it's interesting because I like watching National Geographic. And on National Geographic, it's a lot of nature stories that tell very good stories about life. And I have children, so I like to be able to tell them stories. So the other day I was watching National Geographic, and it was a story about zebras and a migration that they have every single year. They go from one part of South Africa to the next part of South Africa because they're looking for prosperity. How many by a show of hands today, they're looking for some prosperity? Should be everybody in here. We're here for wealth, here for happiness, here for a better state of living. And these zebras, they were going from one part of South Africa to the next part of South Africa because they had a goal. And their goal was, this part of South Africa was drying up and they were looking for prosperity. So on this journey that they were going on, they had to fight lions, they had to fight uh, leopards, they had to fight zebras. But as they was going through this journey, they came to a particular river. And when they got to that river, they stopped. And I'm looking at the show and I'm saying to myself, why did these zebras stop? There was a current going on in the water and the zebras really couldn't swim. But the biggest challenge for these zebras were they realized that there were some crocodiles in the water. And so they had to make a decision. Now, I went from one part of South Africa on my goal, my journey, my, my dream, and now I get to the part where it becomes a little bit challenging and I gotta ask myself this question, what do I really want for myself? And I know that's a question that many of us are challenged with every single day because we're dealing with some circumstances and we're dealing with some situations and we're dealing with things that are contrary in our life than what we really want. It's called what, what I like to call the truth despite appearances. And these zebras, they get to the river and now they got to make a decision because there's some crocodiles in the water. And the commentator says, these crocodiles haven't eaten for 75 days, so they're hungry. And the zebras do something that's unique. They decide that they wanna go through the water. How many of you guys, by a show of hands, have gotten to a place in their life where you've overcome some adversity, you've overcome some challenges, but you've gotten right to the place where you wanna really go a little further, but it seems like things are turning up a bit. And that's where these zebras were. They got to this place where they were Things were turning up a little bit for them, but they made the decision to jump in the water. And as they got in the water, something else kicked in for them. And it was their goal. It was their dream. And as they started to go through the water and get to the other side, the zebras who started to analyze what was actually going, they became paralyzed and they became a victim of the crocodiles in the water. Why are you saying this to me, Jermaine? Well, many of us are sitting here 
in this event today. And for most of us, we've gone to seminars. We've listened to motivational messages. Every single day, we got a reason for us to do well, but we're overanalyzing the reason why we want to go after our dreams, and we become paralyzed in the process. So the question I have for you today is what exactly is it that you want? This was a question that I had to ask myself when I was 25 years old. I woke up, I was sleeping on the floor in the basement on the only coat that I had. And the only question I could ask myself is, I could not live like this anymore. You see, I was 25 years old, I had every reason to do well, but I was failing. I had gone through a divorce, I was spent some time, I was incarcerated, I had bad credit, I lost cars I, through repossession, I dropped out of college, my grandmother and grandfather died through cancer. And so these are all the reasons why I felt that I was where I was at. You see, George Bernard Shaw once said, people are always blaming the circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people that get on in this world are the people who get up, they look for the circumstances they want, and if they can't find them, they make them. So today you have some circumstances. And some circumstances for you might be, well, my credit is challenged. Or somebody may have suggested something to you in your past. And I want you to go back to that childhood past of yours where you felt like you can do anything and anything possible, but someone said something to you that suggested otherwise, and you never took that action. We, as Abraham Maslow once said, we tiptoed through life hoping to arrive at death safely. And many of us, when I really thought about that affirmation, when, when I thought about that quote, I asked myself that question. I said, am I tipping toe through life? Because when I was younger, how many of you guys, by a show of hands, jumped double dutch before? When I was younger, I was afraid to jump double dutch. And one of the reasons why I was afraid to jump double dutch was I thought the rope was going to hurt me. So I didn't want to jump in. But most people were jumping in the rope. And when they jumped in, they were having the time of their life. And the only thing I could do was stand on the sidelines and be a spectator. So I challenge you guys today, don't tiptoe through life hoping to arrive at death safely and not taking advantage of the opportunity to achieve your dream, not taking advantage of the opportunity to achieve your goal, not taking advantage of the opportunity to leave generational wealth for your family. Most people don't know what generational wealth is because they never decide what generational wealth is to them. I don't know. So the reason why you can't manifest the generational wealth that you want for yourself is secretly you're believing that it's not possible for you. You say it's possible for others, but it's just not possible for me. So I want you to decide today what generational wealth means to you and what this does for your future. Because they asked George Bernard Shaw on his deathbed, if you can do your life over again, what would you do? And he said, I would be the person I could have been, but I never was. And that's what many of us do. We wait until the end of life to start making all of the decisions because we were afraid to take action. And most people don't take action because they can't fathom me not taking action and what the consequences will be years down the line. It's called the compound effect. It's called errors in my judgment. A few simple neglected disciplines practice every day equals failure. That's how simple this is. So if you wanna be successful in life or in anything that you do, you have to understand that it's a few simple disciplines practice every single day and that will equal success. You don't have to start at the top because the only place that you can start at the top is when you're digging a hole for yourself. So one step every single day, you have to ask yourself, what do I want to have? What I really want, but what I'll settle for is something totally opposite. So in order for me to progress toward a worthy ideal, what I have to do is I have to grow into the person that attracts the things that I desire for myself. 
That's a, a progression. That word progressive means to grow. So that means that the level of circumstances or the level of thinking that I created all of these circumstances on in order for me to get to the level that I want, I got to start thinking higher than I was thinking when I created these circumstances. So you want to own a home. You want to save some income. You want to do something different for your family. That means you have to start thinking higher than what you're thinking right now. You know, it's interesting. One of my spiritual fathers, Les Brown, we were talking the other day, and we were talking about Bill Gates. Bill Gates has a 100-year goal plan. And I said, how do you have a 100-year goal plan? I'm looking for a goal plan for one year. <laughs> Bill Gates has a 100-year goal plan. And the reason why he has a 100-year goal plan is because not only is he concerned with his children's children, children, he's concerned with the effects of the organizations and the not-for-profit companies and all of the companies that's going to continue after we die. Listen, when you die, uh, if you don't have a library, if you don't have an information or something that you can pass to your children, trust me, it'll, a, a library will be more valuable than some Jordans. Real estate will be much more valuable than the circumstances that you're dealing with. And so for many of us, we're just dealing with circumstances in our life right now because they were suggested. Somebody told us that we couldn't. Somebody told us that we can't. And that suggestion became our own self-imposed limitation. So I want to challenge you guys today. Decide what it is that you really want and take the action. How many Spanish-speaking people in here? Take the action pronto. <laughs> right away. Today. Because here's what happens. Between the moment I make a decision to go after something and the time that it takes me to take action, there's a gap, and in that small gap, here's what happens. Fear, worry, procrastination, shame, guilt, negative influences. All of that stuff nudges its way in this little tiny gap, and I never make the decision, and in five years, I'm looking at myself saying, gosh, five years ago, I should have invested in that property. Five years ago, when I paid the $60 or the $90 to go to that seminar, and it was supposed to change my life, when I left the seminar, I started thinking about all of the things that was going wrong in my life instead of all of the things that's going on right. See, the reason why our affirmations don't work for us is because secretly in my mind, I can't hold the image of what it is that I want long enough. The things that I don't want outweigh what I do want. So when someone asked me the other day, Jermaine, what is a burning desire? What is a burning desire? I had to simply respond to them and say a burning desire comes when you spend time with the thing that you want long enough. I become determined. Now I want it. I got to have it. This real estate investment for me, this piece of property that I'm getting right now is for my children's children. That's a burning desire for me. When my grandmother passed away in 1999, I would have been much more happier if she would have left me some money. And that's the truth. I'm worrying about the death and the loss, but if she would have left me some property in Harlem in the 90s where she lived, I would have been okay. So I want you to decide today, what is it that you want? And then from making the decision from what it is that you want, take the action. Take it right away. Do it now. When the zebras got to the river, they weren't focused on the crocodiles anymore. They were only focused on their goals. Your goals need to be like a magnet. They got to pull you through the tough times. They got to pull you through the tough times. So write those things down. Here's five things to do right away. Identify what it is that you want. What is it that you want to accomplish? You got to know. Most people fail in life not because they aim too high and miss. Most people fail because they aim too low and that's what they're hitting. They don't have a target. 
So identify what you want. The next thing you want to do is write it down. Write it down. Be definite about what it is that you want. Write it down. The next thing you want to do, number three, make a list. What is, what is it that I want to accomplish? And write this list down as though it was impossible for you to fail. Many of us, as soon as we go out there, we just think we're going to fail. So write a list. Organize your list. What's important to me? What do I want to accomplish first? What do I want to accomplish 10th? What do I want to accomplish 20th? Two years, three years, five years. What do I want my life to look like? You got to have an image. You got to have a picture on the screen of your mind so that you can confidently advance in the direction of your dream. So write it down. Organize your list. And last but not least, take action today. Take action. All these speakers in here can charge thousands of dollars to speak, but we put them in a room to give you information for nothing. So take action right away on your goals, on your dreams, on the life that you want to live. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Good afternoon. Uh, as Matt said, my name is Rob Cicero. I'm the owner-operator of Premier Home Inspection Group. I know I've had the pleasure of speaking to a couple of you guys outside. Move over here. Um, any of you that know Matt, unfortunately what I do, there's nothing sexy about my business. Um, you, know, you go into a property, you put an offer. What's that? Um, you guys put an offer in a property, whether it's a 203K or regular home inspection, you know, usually I'd be the next process. Um, I come in there and unfortunately, some properties, you know, I, I manhandle them. Unfortunately, they're not good properties. We have electrical issues, plumbing issues, roofing issues, foundation issues. So that's I'm um, first line of defense for you before you purchase a property that may uh, just not be the right property for you. For some of you first time home buyers or even first time investors, um, you may be a little bit green to certain things and you say you want to call your Uncle Joe who's the contractor who's going to come in there and he's going to save the day for you. Um, I can tell you I, I've been involved with a lot of those transactions that just go sideways. So. Uh, but just touching base on the 203K side, my role is is to protect you and the uh, you and the lender to make sure that the money that you're borrowing for forecasted value really gets applied back to the property. Um, I come out there for the progressional draws. We release the draws to the contractor based off the work that's been completed. Um, anybody in this room done a 203K? Only one person. Wow, a lot of green people in here. Anybody purchase a home and had a home inspection? Okay. Um, so hopefully the inspector did protect you, pr uh, shine the light on some of the issues that may, you know, either be potential issues or issues that are currently going on with the property that can be either addressed prior to or after closing. Um, anybody have any questions in regards to? All right, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you, Matt, for bringing me out. Uh, for Matt, I'm bring before I start. I gotta I gotta tell the story because I like Matt. He's a hustler. Um, so it's something that all of you guys can learn from this. This room is actually very impressive. So congratulations. Um, I met Matt about a few months ago on Instagram. So he, he was hit, hit me in my DM and he, was, he said some encouraging words and I'm like, thanks bro, I appreciate it. And then he hit me again and I'm like, thanks, I appreciate it. You know, what's up, I appreciate you. <laughs> and then um, he hit me again and he's like, yo, let's link up. So I'm like, all right, cool, let's set up a call. And he's like, no, nah, I wanna come to your office. I'm like, all right, um, I'm like, okay. I'm not opposed to that. So. We, we couldn't do that, so we, we did a conference call. But it didn't end at that. He's like, okay, I want to interview. I'm like, okay. Um, I'm like, so I have an office in Westchester, and I have an office in Manhattan. But I'm in Westchester most of the time. So I said, okay, well, I'm in Westchester. I kind of said it to kind of discourage him a little bit, to be honest, because <laughs> I knew he, he lives in Long Island. So I'm like, well, I'm in Westchester. I don't know. He's like, all right, cool. I'm like, all right. So he took the train. I picked him up from the train station. He had his camera guy. and. We had a great conversation. We spoke for like an hour. And um, from there, it didn't stop there. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, I got an event, and I want you to speak. I'm like, OK, cool. So here we are today. I live in Westchester. So I woke up today by plow trucks. And I'm like, oh, man. It's a blizzard outside. I'm like, man, I got like, for half a second, I was going to text him. Like, I'm like, no, nah, that's my man. I can't do him like that. So. I'm here, I'm here now, and that's most important. So yes, we're gonna talk about something that is 180 from what 
I guess, has been talked about so far as far as real estate. So I'm a financial advisor. I have a financial planning firm. And um, I don't specialize in real estate. I don't do real estate. But I'm glad that Matt brought me out, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation because financial literacy is something that isn't taught in school, and it's something that we have to learn as adults, right? So when we learn in financial literacy, we have to learn the whole picture and not just learn one aspect. So it's great that you guys are here today for real estate, uh, but real estate is not the end-all, be-all when it comes to financial planning and investing and diversifying your assets and taking care of your family and leaving a legacy and stuff like that. So we're going to talk about uh, a bunch of other stuff in 15 minutes. And then I'm going to open it up for, for questions and answers. And you know, hopefully I could be of some value. So in regards to real estate investing, real estate is a very trendy thing right now. And it's great. It's great. It's a great trend, right? Because we need to own more property. We need to own more land. We need to own more houses. But I see a lot of enthusiasm in real estate, but I don't really see a lot of enthusiasm in other areas of investing, right? So like when we talk about stock market investing, it's not as sexy right now as real estate, right? But it's something that you probably should be educated on as well because they're different, right? So stocks, what we call liquid investments, real estate is non-liquid investments. So if you have three homes, you might be a millionaire on paper, a multi-millionaire on paper, but you're not gonna be able to come up with cash tomorrow, right? Where if you have money in stock market investments, then that's what we call liquid investments. And if you need money, you can have it wired to you within a couple of days, right? So there's different pros and cons with both. Um, but the key is to learn about everything so you can properly educate yourself. And that way you can balance your portfolio, right? So when you say, when you hear people say talking about balance their portfolio, <coughs> what they're referring to is to have a mix of different assets, what we call asset classes. Right, asset classes. So it's like I, I compare it to eating a meal. If you're starving, you have nothing to eat, then you know you have a piece of chicken that's better than starving of dying of starvation, but that's not a balanced meal, right? You need a carb, you need vegetable, and you need protein. Now you have a balanced meal. So it's the same thing with financial planning and your investments and your portfolio, right? So when we talk about stocks, um, does anybody here anybody here own stock? All right, great. So most people own stock, even if you don't know that you own stock, because if you have a 401k, if you have a 403b, you have a retirement plan, it's invested in the stock market nine times out of 10, right? So stocks are something that a lot of times people don't get fully involved in because it's human nature that we don't do anything that we don't feel comfortable with, right? Especially when it comes to money. So nine times out of 10, most people stop at the start line when it comes to investing because it's not something that they feel familiar with and it's not something that they feel comfortable with and they just won't want to get involved. So stocks are not complicated. In my opinion, it's actually easier than real estate to understand, I'm biased. But um, it's very easy to understand, to comprehend, and it, it's easy to invest in, right? Because you can buy stocks yourself. You don't even need somebody like me, a financial advisor to help you buy stocks. You can go online. There's apps like Robinhood, there's websites like E-Trade, Trade, Ameritrade, all kinds of stuff. But it's kind of like Jermaine, he gave the analogy of double dutch. I'm glad I didn't go after that guy. He was like a preacher. Um, <laughs> but he gave the analogy of double dutch, right? Whereas you can't really jump in if you don't really know the timing and it's difficult. And that's kind of like stocks for most people, right? So what ends up happening is that you just pick a random company like Netflix and you just hope that you're buying it at the right time and you just hope you're selling it at the right time. You might read a news article or some, your barber gave you a tip. It's like throwing a dart at the board, right? You might win, you might lose, who knows what's gonna happen. So that's obviously not the best way to go about it, right? So if you don't feel comfortable investing in stocks yourself, taking that route, then there's another way to get involved as well, which is called mutual funds, right? Mutual funds makes life a lot easier that allows you to invest in the stock market without actually picking and choosing the stocks yourself. So the mutual funds, you have companies like Franklin Templeton, Oppenheimer, Fidelity, and what they do is that they invest the money for you, and it's bundled, it's like, let's say 150 different stocks bundled into one mutual fund, right? So it's similar to how a 401k works. Whereas you're putting money into a 401k and the money's being invested for you. So if, if Fidelity is your 401k money manager, they are investing your money for you in the stock market. I'm pretty sure that nobody knows, including myself, the stocks that are in your 401k makeup. Nobody knows that. But 
it's in the stock market, it's in stocks, right? So it's a similar type of situation with a mutual fund. Um, now, with a mutual fund, you're paying for that, right? Because it's a service, but like all things in life, nothing is free. So they have what's called the sales charge, right? The sales charge is anytime you put money into the mutual fund, a portion of that goes to the mutual fund companies. So let's say it's 5%. So you put $100 in, and $5 goes to the mutual fund company, $95 goes, gets invested. Now, once it's invested, there's no sales charge on, on top of that, but anytime you put new money in, then you pay that sales charge again, right? So the thing with the mutual fund is that, A, it allows you to invest in the stock market without having to be a stock market genius, without having to pick and choose stocks yourself, and it allows you to invest at very low entry points. So for most mutual fund companies, the minimum that you can invest, if you want to do a monthly contribution, is $50 a month. And the minimum that you can invest if you want to do a lump sum contribution is $1,000. So it's very reasonable. And for that price, you can invest in 150, 200 different companies, right? So that's something that everybody should be aware of. Because like I said, the, the goal of this is to build wealth, right? Because we have a tremendous problem in this country. I'm looking at the demographics of this audience. I see a lot of brown and, and black, I see pretty much all brown and black faces. And um, there's a wealth gap in this country, right? So the Pew Research Center did a study and it said that the average black family in America has a net worth of $1,700. The average Latino family in America has a net worth of 1900 and the average white family has a net worth of $116,000. <clears> so this is across America. Obviously, different areas are different, but net worth is your assets over your liabilities, right? So the reason, there's three main things that make up a person's net worth, the average person. The value of your home, because that's your biggest asset, right? Your retirement account, because most people, their investments as far as stocks and stuff like that outside of their home is in a retirement. That's where most of their money is, 401k, pension plan, stuff like that. And then inheritance, right? So one of the reasons why the net worth is so low is because our communities, us as a people, we lack in all three, right? So a lot of times we don't own the home that we're in, so we're renting, so we never get that as far as on the net worth side. We don't fully understand or we don't fund our retirement accounts correct, or we tap into it or we liquidate them prematurely. So we lack in retirement. And then we don't properly understand the importance of estate planning, leaving a legacy. The, most, the easiest and most efficient way to do that is through life insurance, right? So as Jermaine said as well, where he said he, he wished that his grandmother would have left the money, right? He, he used the, the property. That's one way to leave an inheritance, but it's also another way to leave an inheritance through a life insurance. That's the easiest way, the most cost-effective way, right? So what ends up happening is that, unfortunately, when somebody passes away, they're not leaving any legacy. They're not leaving a money for us to get one step ahead. They're actually leaving us debt. Now we have to pay for their funeral. Then you have to go to your church, your religious organization. You have to pass the pot. You have to have GoFundMe pages. And... What ends up happening is that it actually sets you back. Okay. Oh, All right. Okay. So yeah. So um. Okay. Threw me off. I'm not, I'm not even gonna hold you. I just that kind of threw me off. I'm like this is FBI recording this. All right. So it's important to to do that, right? So now we go to if anybody. Follow me on Insta follows me on Instagram. I like to tell stories. Uh, I should have been a storyteller. I might write a book. But I like to tell stories because I just think it's interesting to relay information via stories, right? So we talk about retirement planning. We have to talk about defined benefit and defined contribution, right? So a long time ago, like 50 years ago, 60 years ago, the only type of retirement plan that there was was a defined benefit plan, right? And the defined benefit plan is a pension plan where you worked a job for 30 years and you retired and you got a check every month for the rest of your life and you lived a good life and that was it, right? So you see workers at like GM and all of the car companies and everybody, it, was, it wasn't, you didn't have to worry about retirement. But the problem with that is that it's costly to companies, right? So around 1970, in the 1970s, 
the companies had the bright idea to switch over from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan. Defined contribution plan is when you put money in out of your paycheck and you're fully responsible for funding your retirement. So that birthed the 401k plan, right? 401k is different names for it. 401k is for for-profit organizations. 403b is for nonprofit organizations. You have a 457 plan. You have a TDA for teachers. Different names, but it's still the same thing. So now they're not responsible, them being your job, they're not responsible for putting money away for you. You're responsible for putting money away for yourself. If you don't put enough money away for yourself, then you're just screwed, for lack of a better word, right? Now, there's still some, some jobs with pensions, mostly union jobs, right? So if you're a firefighter, if you're a police officer, if you're a teacher, those jobs still have pensions in some states. Teachers, they, they kind of trying to fight that. But that's it. Right? Most for-profit organizations don't really have pension plans anymore. They have 403Bs and 401Ks, so it's important to fully understand that, right? Because this is going to be the biggest asset that you have, and this is what you're going to be living off of in retirement. So to not fully understand it and to not fully fund it is a grave mistake. You don't understand how many people I see that come to my office that are in their 50s, that are in their 60s, that have very little saved in a retirement account, and they don't know what they're gonna do, right? Because nobody should solely rely on Social Security. Social Security might not even be around in 20, 30 years. Even if it is around, it's not enough. Social Security was never designed to be your sole source of income, right? So you should not, especially in New York, if you're, if you're relying on Social Security, you are going to be in deep water, right? So now you have to fully understand about your retirement plans, right? How to fund your retirement plans. How, many, how much money you should put into retirement. So there's two types of retirement plans. For the most part, there's the 401k, which is called traditional 401k, then there's the Roth 401k. Now every job doesn't offer a Roth option, but mostly every job offers the regular traditional, right? So the regular and traditional one, you put money in and it lowers your taxable income. That's the benefit of it. So if you make $80,000, you put 5,000 in, now you're taxed on 75,000, right? So you save money on taxes, but it's fully taxable on the back end when you take the money out, right? So when you take the money out in retirement, you're paying state and federal tax. This is why a lot of people move to Florida because Florida doesn't have any state tax, right? Texas has no state tax, Nevada, New Hampshire, there's a few states with no state tax, but of course New York has state tax. So the difference between that and the Roth is that when you put money in the Roth, now if you make 80,000 and you put 5,000 in, you're still taxed on 80,000. You get no tax break up front. It doesn't lower your taxable income. But when you take the money out in retirement, it's tax-free. So if you have a million dollars in a traditional 401k and you retire and you took out the whole million dollars at one time, you would probably net like $600,000. Because what happens is that now that million dollars puts you in the highest federal tax bracket because it's treated like ordinary income. So now you're in the highest federal tax bracket and you pay state tax. So almost 40, maybe 45% of the money will go to taxes. If you had a million dollars in your Roth and you retire, you took out the million dollars, you get $1 million. So that's a $400,000 difference, right? So just a little stuff like that is important to understand. And then, so you, when you leave a job, or if you're self-employed, you can still contribute to your, to your retirement, even if your job doesn't have a plan for you via what's called an IRA, right? So I, uh, I heard somebody say it was 5,500. If it was 5,500 last year, this year is actually 6,000, the limit of how much money you can put into an IRA. What the IRA stands for is the individual retirement account. So you have a Roth IRA and you have a traditional IRA. Just like how the 401k and the Roth IRA and the Roth 401k works, but the individual. Now, this is a real estate seminar, so I'm gonna talk about some real estate stuff as well. So a lot of times people ask the question because, so what ends up happening is that when you buy a home or you're looking to make a large purchase, the average person doesn't have a lot of money in the bank. The average person doesn't have a lot of money in the stock market but they might have a pretty substantial amount in their 401k, right? So they want to use their 401k money or an IRA money to buy a home, right? So I get the question a lot. Can I use my 401k to buy a home? Can I use my IRA to buy a home? Now, you can, you can roll over a 401k into an IRA. There's different types of IRAs. If you want to buy real estate with your retirement money, it has to be what's called a self directed IRA, self-directed IRA, right? Because a regular IRA, you have to invest in traditional investments like 
stocks, mutual funds, bonds, stuff like that. If you want to invest in more exotic investments or out-of-the-box investments like cryptocurrency or mortgages or real estate, then you have to do a self-directed IRA, right? It's a little bit more involved, but the long short of it is that you transfer the money over into a, a trustee company because every company doesn't offer self-directed IRAs, but some companies do. So it's a trust company. So you transfer the money from a retirement account to a trust company. Now you have a self-directed IRA. Now you can use the money in a self-directed IRA to buy a property, but all of the profit that you get has to come back into the IRA, right? So that way you avoid paying taxes on it. And when you Wait, sell... Man, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Rewind that. Say that again. All right. So... <laughs> Rewind that. You got to drop a bomb on that. You said you can roll your 401k... You can roll your 401k into, and, into a self-directed... Now, I'm not saying this is a good idea to do because there's pros and cons with everything in life. I'm just providing information, I'm not telling you to do it. Okay. But you can roll a 401k into a self-directed IRA. Through the self-directed through the self-directed IRA, you can invest in real estate, right? You don't pay any taxes on it. The reason why it's called a rollover is because you're rolling money from what the government calls one qualified plan to another qualified plan. When it's qualified, you only pay taxes when you take the money in cash, meaning you put it in your bank account. So if you roll it over into an IRA, you avoid paying taxes on it, right? So when you roll it over to a self-directed IRA, now you don't pay taxes. So from there, you can buy property. You can invest in real estate, right? Now when you invest in real estate, it's still, you're still not paying any taxes on it. But as I said, all of the profits that you get from that, so if you have a rental uh, unit, right, and you're renting it out and you're making money every month, that money has to come back into the IRA. You can't put that money in your bank account. If you do, then, then you're going to have to pay taxes. And then when you sell it, when you sell the property, let's say you made $50,000 profit when you sold it, now that money has to come back into the IRA as well. Then you could repeat the process or you could do whatever you want. But it has, the money has to stay in the IRA in order for it to not be taxable. When you take money out of a retirement account prematurely, prematurely is before 59 and a half, then you pay a 10% penalty. You pay state tax, federal tax, and a 10% penalty. So what happens a lot of times is that people leave their job, they wanna buy a home, they only have money in their 401k, they, they liquidate their 401k, they don't fully understand the consequences, and then you don't have to pay taxes on it right now. Like, let's say right now, in February, right, or March. March, you take money out of your retirement account, like, let's say $50,000, right? You liquidate the whole thing, and you buy a home. You don't have to pay taxes on that money right now. So you're thinking it's all good. You got a home, $50,000. But around this time next year, you get a tax bill for $20,000, $25,000. Now you don't have 25,000, so now you're screwed. So it's important to fully understand that as well, right? Before you make these decisions, A, you should educate yourself, and B, you should speak with a professional, right? That can help you out with it. Now I want to ask you a question. So if I have a half a million dollars in my 401k, I can roll over the entire half a million dollars into this self-directed IRA you were speaking on, and if use that to fund all my real estate projects. Yeah, if you, have a, if you have a half a million dollars, the first thing you should do is call me. That's the first <laughs> thing. For, for anything, for anything, you should call me. And um, <laughs> yes, you can, you can. And you could do partial too. That's important, it doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? So you can roll over half of it into a regular IRA and half of it into a self-directed IRA. If you don't wanna take the full risk or if you wanna kinda diversify it, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. So you can, you can have multiple IRAs, right? You can have one IRA which is invested in stock. You can have one IRA that's invested in real estate. So you can do that as well. That's another, that's another option. So is that IRA earning interest? Which one? When the the self-directed. When I put my monies into there, let's say I make profit. I make 100K flip with that money, right? And I put that 100K back in there. Now I have 600K. Mm -hmm. Am I earning interest on that money if it's, I'm not it, touching it? Most of the time it's in a money market account, meaning like it's just... Not really, a little bit, but not really. It's kind of just sitting until you decide what to do with it next. Or if you, you can, so all right, let's say you have it in real estate, right? 
And then, because the self-directed IRAs, you can do all kinds of different stuff. So you can roll it over from real estate and then put it in precious metals and invest in gold or copper, whatever. Like you, it's, it's like I said, that's a, it's a more involved conversation than 15 minutes, but yeah, you have a lot of different options with, with the self-directed IRA. So it depends on what, where you roll it back into, what, what kind of interest you're going to earn on it, what kind of money you're going to make on it. Thank you, DJ. Matt, I know I told you this multiple times. I'm going to say it again. What you did is really remarkable. You put a lot of good people in one room, guys that are sharing a lot of good information, information that I had to learn the hard way, information that I had to actually learn through mistakes. So listen, I, listen, before you go forward, because what's my theme? I say it all the time to you guys. Collaboration is what? Come on, y'all know what I say all the time. Collaboration is what? Greater than competition. Right? Very so when nice. I say what's my theme, come on, guys. I rant about this all freaking day. <laughs> <laughs> y'all know my theme, all right? Next time we'll get it better, but go ahead. So I, I know we have a little bit of time left, so I'm going to try and, I guess, shorten it as best as I can provide you with as many gems as I can, right? So Gems. Gems, there we go. So I'm, I'm, I'm a representative of WeLend. I'm one of the principals there. We are hard money lenders. What is a hard money lender? I know there's a lot of new investors and a lot of first time home buyers. A hard money lender really is a, kind of the same concept of what a conventional lender is, right? We give you money on real estate. We provide you the financing. But the difference is the way in which we underwrite the deal. A lot of times today, like for example, Flagstar, they're great at what they do. I know Matt is a representative of them. They, they're great at what they do. But they're really driven on your income. They're really driven on your bank statements, what assets you have. Um, their biggest concern is making sure you have credit scores of 680 or above. Forget all that. We don't do any of that as hard money lenders. Our biggest concern is your investment. Are you making money? And that's actually very important. So me, for example, when I started real estate, we had money to buy properties ourselves. We didn't need a hard money lender, but we still use the hard money lender. The reason why is because we were the hard money lenders were my gatekeepers. They made sure the investment made sense. They made sure that I am profitable at the end of my investment. And that's very important because that's what we do today. And I'm happy to do that for you guys as well. So in essence, that's kind of what we do. We look at the asset. Now, what are our terms? What can we do for you? In essence, we can finance up to 90% of your purchase and 100% of your renovation. Some of you might think, well, what, what is he talking about? So let's just say, hypothetically, let's say you're buying something for $100,000. And let's say you're telling me, Ruben, I need an additional $50,000 for the renovation. I say, great, I'll give you $140,000. And I'll explain to you how. I'll give you $90,000 on your purchase. So literally, when you come to the closing, all you have to bring is that 10%, that $10,000. I bring the rest. In addition to that, I give you the full $50,000 for your renovation. So as you're doing the work, I reimburse you for the money. So in essence, I'm giving you $140,000 on your $150,000 investment. 90% of your purchase, 100% of your renovation. The other difference in hard money lending is that, again, we don't look at your income. We don't even ask for your tax returns. We don't ask for your bank statements. Our center of attention is the property. So. What does that mean? That means you just have to be able to make money, right? A lot of you here are first time investors. You guys have trouble finding deals. Today's market, it is troublesome. We can help you with that. And the reason why is because we ourselves were in the business for many years. We know all the players. We know all the brokers. We know all the wholesalers, some of whom are here in this room. So it's very important that you guys engage with as many people as you can today. We'll introduce you to them. In other words, we'll create the deal flow. Our rates, rates are anywhere between 9 and 10%. Our points, two points, all of which is paid upfront at the closing. Now, there are no upfront fees, meaning that you don't pay us until we provide you the money. So, a lot of other hard money lenders, they charge you a $1,500 application fee. We don't do any of that. There is no application fee. If we give you money, that's the only time we charge you. Um, what else? Not only do we do in New York, we also do in New Jersey, for finance, Connecticut, Maryland, Florida, I know a lot of people here from Ohio. Wherever you go, we go there with you, right? Um, like I said, another thing benefit to us is that we don't have prepays. So most of our loans are for a period of 12 months, right? So within 12 months, you have to repay us, but you can pay us back within five days. So a lot of times I have guys that are coming in, they're saying, Ruben, I have money coming in overseas. It's coming in literally about two weeks, but I need to close on this ASAP. 
no problem. I'm giving you the money just so you know in seven days. It doesn't take me 30 days. It doesn't take me 60 days. It takes me seven days to give you the money. So if you call me on a Monday, today, let's just say today's what? Saturday. You call me on Saturday, the next Friday, the Friday coming, we're at the closing table. In other words, I give you that $140,000 on that Friday. Great afternoon. How y'all feeling? Great. So one thing, I'm going to give it the best that I have, make sure I answer all your questions or direct you somewhere where you can get your questions answered. I'll spend most of my time answering questions, making sure that you leave here informed about our market in Cleveland. And so in return, I'm going to need your energy, your involvement, because together we all win, right? Let's grow. So anyway, I'm Beyond Win from Cleveland, Ohio. I've been investing in real estate for over a decade, flipping properties, selling turnkey properties, and building a rental portfolio. Around 2007, when the market changed, before that I was putting properties together, selling them to homeowners. It, it, it was sweet. And then 2007, the market crashed. So when the market crashed, most of the people that were involved in real estate they decided to go do something else, else because the market, real estate left them. Most people say that they left real estate in 2007. They didn't. Real estate left them. Because what, if we understand something, it's real simple. Real estate has been in fashion before we got here, before we were born, and it's going to be in fashion when we leave. So when the market changed, I started thinking of ways of uh, how I could adapt and continue to make money. Quitting was never an option. So one day, I was at a meeting with my sister at Borders Bookstore before they closed down, and she was looking through some magazines. And one of the magazines she was looking through was the Real Estate, the Real Estate Investor magazine. Anybody familiar with that magazine? And so she was looking through the magazine, and she brought it to me. She said, I think you may like this magazine. So I started going through the pages of the magazines, and I seeing terms, turnkey properties, you know, these returns, and people all in other countries buying properties in the United States. I bought the magazine, and when I went home, I ordered a subscription to the magazine. Reading through the magazine, every page, I got the idea to do exactly what they were doing in the magazine. They were selling turnkey properties. Turnkey property is a property that's already rehabbed, a tenant in place, a paying tenant in place, under property management. So it's a simple investment for out of state and out of countries to get, out of state and out of country investors to get involved in because they don't have to look for properties, they don't have to manage crews, and they don't have to manage the property. The property is already cash flowing with the tenant in place under property management. So when I seen that model, I knew it would be great for me. I have the teams in place, I have the property management in place, I have the resources to find properties. So I started selling turnkey properties. My first client was a gentleman out of Las Vegas, Nevada. He's seen, he seen the properties we, we put on um, Craigslist, it was three properties to be exact. He called, it took me about three weeks, he called, he liked what he seen online, he flew into Cleveland, we viewed the properties. It was one of the fastest sales that I ever done. Viewed the three properties. He gave me a thousand dollars earnest money, and in ten days he wired the rest of the money. The deal it was one hundred sixty-five thousand. Three properties. That's how I started turnkey investing because the market changed. Quitting wasn't an option, and what I understand is people that's in position that make money, they want to keep making money. So we had to come up with a solution for people to spend the money with us. So the solution was turnkey properties. Cleveland, why Cleveland? How many other cities that you can buy a property from forty to $50,000 rehab with a tenant in place? How many other cities can you do that in? What's the average price for a property here in New York? So in Cleveland, we sell properties the average of forty to fifty thousand dollars 
rehab with a tenant in place under management, forty to fifty thousand dollars, paying eight to eight fifty a month average. If you Google the top rental markets in the United States, don't take my word for it. Google the top rental markets in the United States. Cleveland is on the list. Another thing that's good about Cleveland is eight Fortune 500 companies are headquartered in Cleveland. Anybody ever heard of Cleveland Clinic? It's one of the top hospitals in the world located in Cleveland. Anybody familiar with Amazon? They have two locations in Cleveland that just opened up. Translation, more jobs. More people coming to Cleveland. Last time I checked, Cleveland had a 90% occupancy rate. Anybody ever heard of Case Western Reserve? It's one of the top medical colleges in the United States. It's also in Cleveland, AKA more opportunity. How many people are interested in buying investment properties? Wow, whole room. It's funny how with a lot of the major things that go on in the world, and it, it may just be me, it seems like most of the things that's major, we late to the party. Do, do anybody else feel like that or is it just me? So this has been going on in Cleveland for the last 10 years. Translation. Another thing that's not in our favor is collaboration. When other groups come to our market, they come in groups together, pooling their resources together. Because together you can do more. You can buy more properties. You can get a better deal when you go to the banks and asset management companies that want to sell the properties in bulk. A friend of mine that I met because I helped, because I stopped and talked to an individual leaving the gym one day. I was leaving the gym and an individual walked up to me. He said, hey, you, you, you beyond when I follow you on, on Instagram. I was like, hey, what's up, King? How you doing? He said, I'm doing good. He said, I just started real estate investing. What would you tell somebody just getting started? So that conversation lasted about 45 minutes. I was just sharing my insight, you know, what I would do, what I'm doing, and how I'm doing it. A month passed, he sent me an email. He said, hey King, I just stumbled upon this hedge fund group. I don't speak that language, but I'm sure that you do. I'm not looking for anything in return. The only thing I would like to do is be able to learn from you. So he forwarded me some properties. So I had one of my guys that work with me go out and look at one of the properties. He went and looked at the property. He called me at the property. He said, this is just too good to be true. You probably need to come check this out. So I go look at the property. It was a property in Garfield Heights. It's a suburb in Cleveland. Walked through the property in about five minutes. Called the, the guy that was representing the group. It was a nice property. I picked it up for $21,000. So I had a short conversation with the guy on the phone. He basically went over the process for me to buy the property. He went over the process. I wired him the money in like 24 hours. I sold the property without doing anything for 34,000. After, after that, I did a couple more deals with the guy. And I focused on building a relationship with this guy because I was interested to know how are you buying 30 to 40 properties a month in like 10 different states. 
So we had a phone conversation, and he basically told me how he did it. And the phone conversation probably was five minutes. He said, I partnered with two of my friends. One of my friends is great at raising money. The other one is great at building relationships. So the one friend had the relationships with the asset management companies that's selling all the properties. The other friend, great at raising money. And the guy that I spoke with, he was good at marketing the properties, the day-to-day. -day. They pooled their resources together. Last year, they did 200 properties. And they just started 24 months ago investing in real estate. The key word there was collaboration. Greater than competition. Always. Together we all win. Period. And we need to, we need to learn that before it's too late. So with real estate, people ask me about strategies. And I simply tell them. And most people don't believe it and they want me to get to the good part. The best strategy that I have, the strategy that's responsible for my success and all the other success that's in the works right now that I can't even see is being intentional about building and maintaining great relationships. That's my strategy. Me and Jermaine, me and Jermaine met on Facebook. This is our first time meeting in person, and it seemed like we grew up together and been knowing each other our whole life. It's relationships. Everything we want, it starts with a relationship. You stand out in a world for the people that just focus on money when you focus on the relationship. So with the guy that did the 200 properties last year, I focus on the relationship. Sending them a card, like, thank you. The last conversation I had with him, he gave me the opportunity to bid with him and his partners on these assets every month. He sends me the list, 10 different states, and he allowed me the opportunity to bid with them to get their discount. But it's relationship. Me stopping, going out the gym, shake somebody's hand, share some information, meet another guy, <laughs> it's life changing. But it's relationships. It's like we focus on, you want to get some money real fast, and like focus on relationships. Like it's the best marketing strategy in the world. All these marketing strategies, they change every day, every week. People spending millions on marketing strategies, and they keep changing. Relationship, like, that don't change. It's a lifetime. And it goes wherever you go. Some people see it on a small scale. You go to the club, there's 100 people on the line. You know the owner. Like, you could just walk right in. Everything else is the same way. But most of the time, we're looking for a one-night stand. I think that's the best that I have. That right there. It's relationship. I see people online with positive pages, adding value to the world. I court them. Comment on a post. I get the address. I'm a card sender. I send a lot of cards. You damn sure do. I got a card. <laughs> and I tell you, it touched my heart. Like, seriously. I put it in my stories. He's not lying. I'm, I'm going to use that strategy, too. It's genuine. I'm into people. Everything else comes after that. That's my focus. That's my strategy. People. You focus on the relationship, the money follows. For some strange reason, it, it just follows. Focus on the relationship, the money follows. I like leverage. I don't want to work that hard. Most of the deals I do, it's not because of me. I focus on the relationship, and they bring me the deals. They want to partner with me. 
I like partners. I like using other people's money, other people's time. I want to travel the world, share information, and my bank account keep getting filled every month. We don't start a business so the business owns us, do we? How many other people want to travel the world, experience different cultures, eat all kind of food, <laughs> laugh and have fun with the people that you love? If you focus on a relationship, get everything you want. Some of the best deals that I did last year came from relationships. And people asking me to partner on deals. 